Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional Indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Although this meeting is online and our event takes place at many locations across Canada, we each enjoy the privilege of living and working within an Indigenous territory. As a gesture of appreciation for our use of these lands, I would ask that you join me in acknowledging the people who have lived and thrived in these regions across the continent for tens of thousands of years. Tonight kicks off DGC Visionaries 2021, where we celebrate DGC filmmakers work at all the major filmmakers across Canada throughout the year. This week is dedicated to hot docs in Toronto and Doxa in Vancouver. We're extremely fortunate to have Academy Award nominated filmmaker Steve James as our moderator tonight. Steve's previous work includes Academy Award nominated films Hoop Dreams and Abacus Small Enough to Jail. Other award winning work includes Stevie, The Interrupters, No Crossover, The Trial of Alan Iverson, and Life Itself. His stars docuseries America to Me was one of the most acclaimed TV shows of 2018. His most recent docuseries City So Real premiered to rave reviews at Sundance and on National Geographic's Hulu in 2020. It's a real privilege to have Steve with us. Our featured director tonight is award-winning director Young Chang, whose new film Wuhan Wuhan is at Hot Docs and Doxa. Young is the director of Up the Yangtze, China Heavyweight, and the Fruit Hunters. He's currently completing a screenplay for his first dramatic feature, Eggplant, which was selected in 2015 to participate in the prestigious Sundance Labs. Chung's films have, Chang's films have premiered at international film festivals, including Sundance, Berlin, Toronto, and IDFA, and have played theatrically in cinemas around the world. Up the Yangtze was one of the top grossing documentary releases in 2018. In 2013, China Heavyweight became the most widely screened social issue documentary in Chinese history, with an official release in 200 mainland Chinese cinemas. His films have been critically acclaimed, receiving awards in Paris, Milan, Vancouver, San Francisco, Canada, Taiwan, Golden Horse, Cinema I Honors, among others, and have been nominated at Sundance, Independent Spirit, and the Emmys. Cheng's films have been shown on many international networks, and he's the recipient of the Don Haig Award, the Yolanda and Pierre Perrault Award, and the Guggenheim Emerging Artist Award. In 2013, he was invited to become a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Absolutely incredible to have these two filmmakers here with us tonight. Please welcome Young Chang and Steve James. Come on in. Hey, thanks. Well, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Oh, 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 well, that's cool. <laughs> oh, we miss lovely. It. But this is if everybody that's watching was here, you'd be hearing exactly that. So <laughs> great well, it's great to be here. Great to be here. Well, it, yeah. Before I turn it over to you guys, I just want to point out to, to the audience uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. That's where you can type in your questions. Steve will be keeping an eye on uh, all those questions coming in and he'll try to get to as many as possible as he can throughout the night. And a reminder to everyone that you can choose your view on your screen settings uh, with a button at the top right, the view button in the top right hand corner. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, really looking forward to this. Over to you guys and I'll see you at the end. Thanks so much. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Hans. Yeah. Uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, um, before we dive into it, uh, it's a real honor to have um, my hero, you, uh, doing this for me, because truly, um, back in the day in, in 95, 95, right, when I saw Hoop Dreams for the first time, uh, that changed the way I thought about filmmaking, and um, it's a real honor. So, firstly, uh, I'm just kind of tickled that you're you're willing to able to do this. So thank you so much, and and I want to thank the DGC for kind of putting this together too. Yeah. Yes. Kudos to everyone, and and I'm thrilled to do it because I am a big fan of your work, my friend. So, um, uh, 
so let's dive in. Uh, sure. This new film, this new film is is quite. I mean, I'm lucky because I've gotten to see it. I guess uh, the people who are tuning in here will not have seen it yet. Uh, uh, so I'm fortunate enough to have seen it. It's a terrific film, and it's it's not what I, one of the things I I love about it is it's not what you expect when you hear of what the film is going to be about. I mean, mm. it is in the sense of it is about the virus and it is about Wuhan, but it's not it's not in, in a refreshing way. It's not the film one would expect necessarily. Mm. And I want to get into that, but maybe first start by telling me how you came to be involved in this film. Yeah, uh, it, it, it was back in, well, about this time last year, in fact, and uh, um, there's a longer backstory to it, and I'll, maybe I'll just give you the, the. I'll say I'll just tell you because I think it really helped get my head around the story that I wanted to tell with the footage that I received. Um, so I wasn't on location making this film. In fact, um, I was uh, asked if I wanted to uh, put this uh, 300 hours of footage that was filmed at the uh, at the peak of the um, of the pandemic last. February 2020 in Wuhan and if I wanted to take that footage and and see it through into a film into a whole piece and uh, and at that time I was um, in a sad state you know I think a lot of us were and I, I had just released a movie and I was um, it was called this is not a movie uh, about the journalist Robert Fisk and I, I felt stuck you know I was on the couch um, worried about the future and I uh, and, and the week prior, I had gone on a walk with my daughter and we had a, a horrible kind of, uh, basically an anti-Asian anti racist incident, you know, and uh, just in my neighborhood. And it was, it was really, it threw me off. It threw me off and it was shocking. And that was early days, you know, when we were wearing masks and, and, and I think, uh, I still think about it a little bit now and, and how, just kind of off it was. And, and now, of course, with things that have gone on recently and certainly in Atlanta, um, how, how, uh, how discombobulating and upsetting that, that event was and, uh, and, and in a small way, what happened to my daughter and I. So the week after that incident, I received this note from Starlight Media, who's the studio behind this film. And they asked me to, if I wanted to make the film. And, and I said, well, I got to take a look at the footage first. And, and, and when I looked at the first 10 hours, uh, I think what stood out to me was the, were the human stories and, and that, kind of, uh, that kind of slice of life into a, a portrait of a city of people, uh, not unlike uh, what you and I have experienced here in North America and around the world, essentially, that, you know, I was, I think the heartbeat of the story was these everyday people and, and these real, you know, three dimensional kind of emotions that each and everyone was going through. And, and that's what I connected to. Yeah. And that, that comes through loud and clear in the film. Um, what was it, uh, you know, given our, our, our at least some uh, a substantial, I think, part of our audience today, they're going to want us to dig into the weeds a little bit here sure. about the craft. What was it um, like? Uh, I have a little bit of experience myself with, with working on a film that I wasn't really present for the shooting of when I uh, did it some years ago. Yeah. Uh, swore I'd never do that again. Um, <laughs> but, Why but, do you say but, that? Why do you say that? What was, uh, what well, was no, that like? no, it was, it was actually, it, it was actually, it was rewarding experience, but it, yeah. you know, I missed not being there, yeah. um, at, you know, as part of that process. What was that like for you? You're a hands-on kind of filmmaker. Yeah. So what was it like for you to kind of enter this process in the way you did? Yeah, it was, um, it was it was uh, it was definitely weird. So so I think I just a little more context is that I got three hundred hours of footage that was filmed by a team of thirty who were who were in Wuhan and they were locked down as they were about to set up to make a film about uh, the Yangtze River, and so they pivoted and then focused their camera and their crew onto stories of everyday people, frontline workers in the city of Wuhan at the peak of you know, the, uh, the pandemic. Um, and, uh, um, so, uh, 
so I had inherited this footage and, and, and for me, it was, um, you know, usually as a director, you, you have that, you have that experience of where you are the one behind the camera, you get to see all the footage, you, you have connection with the ins and outs and the, and all of the setup that it goes to make a film, you know, and, uh, and in this instance, it was sort of sitting, uh, being removed from that and, and, and kind of feeling more like an editor in a way, um, uh, kind of feeling like I was in a position where I could look at this footage and this material with the fresh eyes that an editor would. Um, and that was kind of kind of cool in a way. I appreciated that process. Uh, um, I wasn't editing the film. I had editors working remotely in Los Angeles while I was in Toronto. Uh, and then Cartempuin, who, who also were the associate uh, production company with this film, they, they um, they're based in Chicago, of course. Uh, so it was kind of this th three time zone type of filmmaking process where I was sitting here in my room um, uh, trying to do this process of working. It didn't work so that we could work live. You know what I mean? It was a, it was a, there was a way of like um, having to kind of let go of that live feeling of editing being in the room, which was unfortunate. Um, so on the one, in the ones, in the one instance, there was that idea of not being on location. And then the other one was having to let go and knowing that I wouldn't be able to sit with the editor uh, to work on the film. Um, uh, but in the end, we found a way to make it work. You know, I'm, I'm grateful that even during a pandemic with the technology that we have, I uh, we we're able to cut a feature doc. Um, you know, I think if it was 20 years ago, or so we wouldn't have been able to do this and I would be in a different state of mind. I think, you know, this gave me a real outlet. And uh, I think my team made up of all, you know, Chinese American editors and, and filmmakers, we just kind of honed in on the message of the story, which was really about the humanistic beyond the headlines, beyond the, the so-called Kung flu. You know, I think we were very driven uh, to get around that and to show Wuhan as not a uh, kind of backwards um, uh, village market, you know, wet market. It, it's much more of a, a place than that. And that, that, was, that was what we wanted to do. You know, I wonder if maybe we should show a little this, clip. This would from, be the great, yeah. I was just gonna say, it's, <laughs> that's a great introduction to this first clip that we wanted to show. And I think it gives people enough context to, to start to see what it is you're talking about that you were after and got. Sure. Sure, I'll set it up. It's uh, it's in the so we film with five different characters. Uh, one of them is uh, a uh, a mother and son who were stuck in this temporary shelter, uh, you know, kind of a pop up hospital um, for people with asymptomatic or or cases of of COVID that weren't ICU, you know, kind of the necess necessitated the ICU. Uh, so. Um, uh, here's here's the clip. It's not the opening of the film. It's sort of, uh, I'd say, what, the first 5, 10, 15 minutes into the movie. <笑>你们这一组有没有要看的心理的病人了焦虑的呀失眠的呀然后情绪低落的呀我现在可以告诉你我这个厂里面每个人都需要心理要我真是想我给你反馈一下刚才去问了那些医生现在不是说愿意要
，我说那就学个战争时代呀，就像我们都是木头一样的，但回家的一幕一幕都在我们脑海里面。我给你教个方式，晚上的时候如果。一闭上眼睛，那些人的画面就出现了，你就要立刻让自己睁开眼睛，回到现实中，不断的告诉自己，现在是好的，现在是安全的，没有人能伤害得了你。我早点跟你们沟通还好，我真的怕给你们带些麻烦，晓得吧？是。全国各个地方的医生，我们不想跟别人的医生。我是从新疆来的。是的，还有广东的。你先按这个来做，是的，是的。如果到明天晚上，我们再带着你去处理一下。谢谢你们，谢谢你们费心了。先吃饭吧。嗯，好好。好好 yeah. So one of the things that that strikes me as I as as I watch the film and see that scene again is, I'm wondering.、Um, Uh, did did the filmmakers on site, the the shooters and and sound people and whoever,、uh, did they have escorts、um, from the government or or from the hospital that that sort of monitored what they filmed in any way? Yeah, I'll give you a little inside、uh, insider kind of process of of filmmaking in China and.、Uh, And I'd say that this is across the board for independent filmmakers,、um, of which, you know, there is a thriving kind of as as you know. I mean,、uh, you know, there's great、uh, Chinese filmmakers and documentary filmmakers from the mainland,、um, many of whom are my colleagues and friends. And、uh, and I think、um, one of the ways of of making films is kind of having one foot in, one foot out. In the process of making the film you want to make, so、um, uh, in this regard,、uh, this team had the kind of permissions and the access to be able to film、uh, with the permits that they had, probably、uh, by way of their connections with、uh, local media or with the、um, you know public broadcasting connections in China to to film and.、Uh, And and I guess out of that you you're able to film what you want to film, and、um, and 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 there's not much filtering in that step.、Uh, so in the raw footage,、um, it's the crew filming and making those decisions what to film.、Um, uh, there isn't any you know censoring happening happening within the camera you know and within the Uh, with it, with minders and things like that, that didn't seem to be behind the scenes. Yeah, and I've been in that. I've been in that experience as well, where I've had the privilege of kind of working through、um, access in stories like when I told China Heavyweight, for example, the film about boxers in China.、Uh, we were able to get access to sports events and、um, you know official sports events, and and that was done. Through the connections that we have, essentially, so、um, one foot in, one foot out. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, here, this uh, uh, good follow-up, I think, is Lulu's question here in、yeah. the Q and A. Is is、uh, how did how did the people get the footage out of China, and how sensitive was the government about that footage and that、yeah. transferring of the footage? Wuhan, Wuhan, as we know, is a very sensitive subject. Uh, to, and you have to be very, very careful.、Um, I think、uh, the way we received the footage was through the through Starlight, the company behind this film, who are a Chinese American company, and、um, and they acquired the footage.、Uh, so I think there was a pretty fair transaction that was done there,、um, one for one. You know what I mean? And so. Uh, uh, We made. We were very careful not to to make sure that there weren't any kind of、um, loose ends, and everyone in the film is credited because uh, uh, I would say I would say quite earnestly that the the I think what what comes across in this film、uh, and and you've seen it, Steve, is that it's not、um, the Wuhan film that I think. We can we can get from some other films that are out there or will be coming out. I mean, my take on the story was what I had at my disposal, and, and what I had was what I saw through the footage was this kind of human 
humanistic story, uh, especially with some of the um, the characters that we follow. And so, um, and so I didn't think we would get into hot water, and and we didn't. So it was uh, it was very kind of in a way it's not it's not a it's not a political politically driven investigative story. It, it's not that. It's it's right. it's sort of what uh, Up the Yanks or China Heavyweight was, which is just sort of going beyond the headlines, um, you know, and and the surface, the statistics, and 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 kind of giving shape to a place. Uh, in a way, I, I think of this story as a as a portrait of the city of Wuhan, um, and and that's and and yeah. And so uh, you know. In my experience, and I think, you know, I expect your experience too, in normal filming situations, right? You, you're out there filming a story and it's evolving as you're film, filming it. You're, you're, um, you're spinning a story in your head of what, what it is you're getting and that may change and yeah. often does change and thank God it does change, right? When you're in the field and then you come back to the edit, uh, uh, editing part of the process and it's like in a way it's like you, yes you have that story and now you have what's you have yeah and you're making the story now and it goes through another change so since you weren't able to be a part of that first phase um where at what point in the process was there a point in the process where it kind of dawned on you what this film wanted to be about did it did it, that take a while or did, was that something you saw in that that first 10 hours that you that kind of really guided you it, it took a little more than that so um uh the team in china and wuhan filmed about nine different characters each you know um full stories uh and and so we had to kind of find uh what was unique in the footage what was what was trying to drive the story forward uh, emotionally and um and so we found that some of these characters, their stories were repetitive, you know, they played the same beats. And so it was, it was a challenge to kind of move beyond that. Um, uh, I think it's, it's interesting you bring this up because yes, it, it, took a, it, it took more than 10 hours to kind of see, see the through line. Um, uh, what I think what I presented to the editing team and I worked with two, uh, two key editors and then we had two, associate editors, um, it just, we, we required a bigger team to kind of see this film through in, in a short amount of time that we had to, to cut it. And, um, and, and what I presented to the team was a, a sense of, uh, let's make a film that's, I was feeling that the footage and the material felt like it could happen over the, the span of three nights and four days, right? And so we attempted to use that as our, our uh, the initial kind of assembly cut. Um, and just to get in the nitty gritty, uh, the first thing was I, I referenced a, a documentary that I quite liked from my uh, from back in the day called uh, September 5th in St. Henry, which is an old 1962 19 National Film Board documentary. And, uh, and it is a kind of slice of life story. Uh, there are elements of that that I found inspiring. Obviously, it's a, I, I feel it's a bit dated now, but uh, Obviously, but um, but I like the approach to that story, and I like the poeticism of it, uh, the pacing, the tone, um, and I think you you in a similar way have a reference Le Jolie May, which is a Chris Marker feature doc uh, from '63. I think there was the two <laughs> kind of had a thing going on there. Thing on, that. I, you know, I'd like to read into that a little more, but um, <laughs> but you know, for for your project City So Real, it's it, it you know I I see that how that was um, influential, inspirational in a way, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I, I took that as, and I presented it to the team and I showed them that film, a 27 minute documentary that you can find online. Um, uh, and so we attempted that first assembly at, at, and, and maintained that kind of day, night, day, night, three, three day, uh, three night, four day structure uh, to the point where it was at a kind of a, early rough gut stage um, and then put it out there and showed it to a small audience. And, uh, and immediately the reaction was very negative. And, and, and I, I realized, and we realized as the team that um, it just felt really forced. This is something, you know, that I'm, uh, as an editor, 
you know, I'm now saying that I'm the director editor, not working on location and seeing the span of a film through the real time it took to make it. You know, this was sitting in an editing room, looking at the material and finding a way to tell the through line, um, to envision the kind of acts and the scenes. Um, I think it uh, it was a it was a it was a I don't know how it works for you, Steve, but in the editing room, but I always find it's a you know you you often it's often the process of taking the long road uh, <laughs> and you fumble along that long road and you get lost a little bit and it's part of the journey you know you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna think you have an answer and then you, you think you're gonna stick with it and then all of a sudden it just you know it doesn't work but then you go back to that original essential idea and that's kind of what we did we went through this long roundabout journey of like that three night four day structure isn't working, you know, and, and initially what, what the problem was is that we were identifying the day, you know, we're saying like, you know, day one, night one, you know, we were identifying right. the actual pace of the 24 hour, 48 hour, you know, 72 hour structure. And it felt ethically kind of dubious as well, because clearly the footage and the stories didn't evolve over a three, three night, four night structure. But me in the editing room, I was like, let's find the story, you know? So, right. so I think when we found the key was, was just such a simple solution was just sort of removing the day stamps and the night stamps. And so you'll see that the film unfolds in the day and night kind of structure, but we take that away, the actual mark of that time. And, and I, I feel like it flows quite well uh, and gives a sense of the passage of time without having to say it was, uh, you know, uh, restricted to a, a, a period of time that didn't really happen anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, I think you you clearly made the right choice there because it, it, it's, I mean, and I understand what you were dealing with because I, you know, um, the last two things that I made, America to Me and, and City So Real, um, yeah. marking time was important to those but they were important in the sense of giving the audience a sense that uh, you're making your way through the school year in America to me, and you're making your way through an election mm -hmm. <laughs> campaign that's going to event, you know, it, was, it so there was, there was a reason for those markers that, that served the story as a whole. Whereas I think in, in your case with this film, they're more a distraction than, than essential to the telling of the story. Right. Exactly um, that. Yeah. And and so I think that was wise. Um, you 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 find some really interesting people. I, uh, there's a couple um, that really is. If if they were if there's if there's two characters who kind of emerged as the biggest stars, if you will, of your of yeah. your film, I would say them. We're going to look at a scene from them, but I don't want to look at that scene yet. Okay. Um, I'd like to I'd like to look at the other scene that we have that we want to show which gets at some of the, I think, the emotional center as well in a, in a different way yeah. that, that is at the heart of this film. And this is one that features a nurse that, that we, we get to know a, yeah. a bit. And we, I think we first meet her when she's getting her hair cut, if I'm not mistaken. Is That's that right? right. That's correct. And, and that was, uh, um, you'll, which you'll is find- a key, Which is a great scene. It's a great moment. And, and it was a sort of a thing uh, that was done uh, um, you know, so many people um, of the frontline workers at the time in Wuhan were volunteers and coming from other places. And, uh, and, and there was this sort of uh, feeling of, of, you know, and also at that time, this was, we're talking about a brand new unknown virus, right? People didn't know what it was. They didn't know. And I think we all went through it, you know, uh, washing our groceries and, and, yeah. and, you know, doing things that we, we thought would help to protect us and, and part of it was cutting hair cutting hair was thought that to be you know to uh, to keep it short essentially and so yeah that was an emotional moment the nurse is nurse susu uh who's who's uh, many of the frontline workers have to isolate in these quarantine hotels where they can't see their family they're stuck for however many months and uh and so this is a scene uh where nurse susu goes back to the quarantine hotel and uh, well let's take a look
宝宝，可乐，可乐，喊妈妈，喊妈妈。说话讲，他不认识他一点。<笑>不认识我了，姐姐呢？奶奶什么时候回来？嗯，妈妈把这段时间忙完了就回来，好不好？等到你可以去上学了，妈妈就回来了，哦、可不可以？要家里面爸爸还有爷爷奶奶都陪着你呢，是不是？我家里来了，你不哭的，不哭啊！我要做妈妈的，我为什么不能做妈妈的？你不要发脾气啊！为什么不能发脾气？你不得看那个书吗？妈妈不是给你买了有那个书吗？上面说的怎么说的？小朋友也要管理好自己的情绪，是不是？我讨厌你。It's a.、Uh... I guess I'd add there that it's it's quite remarkable even now that we have,、um, you know, video and are able to message with video and uh, and um, and have Zoom and whatever and、uh, and I I couldn't imagine if when if I didn't have this、uh, even before the pan, pre pandemic if I was traveling and and I have a young daughter who who's four and and to be away from her. Uh, and not being able to see her or be able to communicate with her, how how that、uh, just、uh, I don't know would be I, I think it would be really hard. Although I, I guess there was a period of my life where I was dealing with that,、uh, you know, the time before video calling, and we would just have to use phones and、uh, and and long distance charges and、uh, you know phone cards and things. I remember that, but it was. You would just be less in communication. I don't know if that's worse or better, but but you see through Nurse Susu how that manifests in a、uh, kind of a challenging way, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think I think clearly one of the strengths of the film.、Um, I mean, there's 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 many things that jump out at me, but two I'll two I'll mention right now. One is is just how you you really do get the sense of how serious.、Um, That the city and the government、uh, and everyone seems to take this situation, and 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 sometimes it's it's hard to it's easy to forget as we watch this now that we all know so much more about this virus now than they did when they were when this filming was taking place, right? right. And and the the level of commitment to. Um, dealing with it is kind of astounding as an as an American and looking at all the struggles that that we went through and and the politicization of it and everything else that that happened around the virus, right?、Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of remarkable.、Um, and then the other thing that that I found quite remarkable is just yeah, it's it's such a human portrait of people who are.、Um, Who are doing everything they can to both survive and to look after others? There's a、That's、there's a great moment in the film where、um, some of the workers、um, take pictures of themselves and put them on their their、um, suits, you know, because you know you you find out, of course, that many of the patients who have, who are very fond of the people that have been looking after them have no idea what they look like、yeah. uh, because that they've been so Covered、uh, and secured against this virus, and they put pictures on their chests and and go to see the、uh, the patients and the, and the and the people say, "Why didn't we think of this before?" You know, it's and it's a very you know the, these are the kind of moments I think that that make this、uh, a very surprising film、um, because we're also I think so used to I won't speak for Canada because I know in Canada the the、uh, Asian Population, Asian Canadian population, and, and the Chinese population is, I think, much more significant,、uh, significant part of the culture there. 
perhaps, is that right, than here in the States? Um, but I think there's an assumption, you know, assumptions that we Americans make, even those that are well-meaning about what China is like and what Wuhan was like, as you said, like the wet market and some well, I think, backward, yeah. you know, I, I wayward think there's, place. Yeah, I think I think there is a, an association that is that people think that you know China is this monolith, and uh, and you know the the Chinese people are part of this monolith, and uh, or it's a monolithic society. When, when in fact there are individuals, and I what I wanted to cut through in this movie was to show that even in the characters of the 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 mo mother and son uh, and son in the temporary shelter, uh, hospital shelter, are, are and you know fighting for her her son um, and fighting for a way, fighting for a way to get out of the Byzantine um, hospital system, healthcare system uh, is the story of individuals, you know, and, and, and I think, I think we universally in tackling the pandemic have often relied on our, our resources as, you know, uh, as, as for frontline workers, especially just sort of figuring it out as they go. You know, I made a short film, Pandemic 19, about American doctors um, it, during the peak, and, and it was just told through their, their video diaries. And, and through that story, you see as well that, that doctors uh, were, were just flying by the seat of their pants, figuring it out as they went along, communicating with each other. One of the doctors in that short film, uh, Dr. Brady in, from Harvard, was in touch with doctors from Wuhan. They were communicating about what to do, you know? And so um, that's what spoke to me, uh, that universality of, of, of just cutting through the bullshit, uh, cutting through the, the, you know, the governmental, the lack of governmental support in many cases. And, and I think in Toronto, currently in Ontario, we can attest to the fact that we are in a desperate situation. Uh, our third wave is worse than our first wave and, and largely due to um, mishap with our uh, local premier. So you know, I think I think um, I think that that uh, uh, that's what spoke to me when I was looking and searching for these stories through the material that we had. Um, and indirectly, I see messages from Gordon here, Gordon Quinn, uh, <laughs> who you know well. And 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 context for those who don't, uh, Gordon Quinn is the. I guess the founder or co-founder, what, what would you, what would you, how'd you? Uh, yeah, co-founder, as I like to say, he's the Quinn of Cartem Quinn. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's right. I never realized that. Is that true that Quinn is? That's true. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. They, they, the three guys put their names together. Oh my it gosh. The, it was the worst idea ever. Um, <laughs> I've always wondered the origins they, of Cartem. They, yeah. they, they were, it was back in the sixties and they were probably, you know, <laughs> doing a little which is legal right. now which we know which is places, legal especially yes. in canada and, yeah. and they they and this is true and and we just have to embarrass gordon a little further <laughs> when they decided to name it cartemquin what they loved about uh combining their three names carter temner and quinn was that it sounded a bit like Potemkin, the famous Russian <laughs> film. Okay, I like that. that, I love that. You, yeah, you, you can only come up with that if you've been, you know, <laughs> I think. Well, just to, yeah, <laughs> but I see Gordon's messages here in the in the Q and A. But also that I uh, Gordon saw the film and a cut of the film uh, early on in our editing process, and uh, and I know Gordon went through COVID and yeah. quite seriously, as we know, and uh, and I believe was intubated and in the ICU. And one comment I'll never forget Gordon made was that in that scene you were talking about where the the hazmat suited frontline doctors put their photos on their chests. Uh, Gordon recounted how it was hard for him to see who was who and uh, in the ICU when and everyone looked the same and you could, I can't remember if he mentioned that you could hear their voices and maybe that was the distinction, but, but in fact, every, it, it just must've been so um, confusing and, and, and scary, I would imagine at that time. And so that that move to put the photos on the chest was through one of the characters we follow, a psychologist named Dr. Zhang, and and uh, who you saw in the IC in the, the temporary shelter footage. She, she talks to yes. the patient, and it's her idea to do that. And 
And, and there's a commentary there, which is really interesting to me to see a psychologist, a Chinese psychologist in China is quite rare. In fact, uh, I think that psychology and, uh, and uh, mental health is something new in, in, in mainland China, most often not something that is used uh, or considered um, helpful. And so to see the psychologist doing the things she does was quite re revealing to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, she's great in the film. So set up for set up for us this last clip that we we'll yeah. want to show, which is and tell us a little bit about this couple. Um, yeah. You know, the the driver and his wife, uh, yeah. because they they are uh, they're a source of of humor, uh, which you think what a film about you know, COVID has got humor, you know, what, yeah. what, what, but they're a source of humor and, and pathos. Um, yes. And we're going to see a really sweet scene later that appears later in the film, but just so people can really understand and appreciate that, maybe set them up a little more. I love the character. So um, they really, for me, were the heart of the film. Uh, uh, in a way, uh, the most relatable for me. I mean, um, so it's uh, their mid twenties, um, a young man and young woman. Uh, the woman is about to give, she's eight and a half months, you know, further, very far into her pregnancy. And, um, and, uh, uh, and her husband decides to become a volunteer driver for the medical um, frontline doctors and nurses. Uh, sh basically shuffling the doctors and nurses to and from the hospitals and their quarantine hotels, much to the disappointment of his wife, who is about to give birth and is worried and concerned uh, that her husband is, you know, putting his life at risk and potentially her, uh, but he is driven to do it. And I, uh, for many reasons, I think it's also sort of a uh, have something to do with their relationship, which is very particular, very special. Um, uh, you know, I know people like them and in some ways, not to that degree, I see it in my, I see the young man in myself and, and my partner, uh, my partner, Annie, uh, as the uh, sort of as the, 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 the wife um, in this film. I, I could relate to it. I could relate also having, you know, having a four-year-old, having been through the birth, a recent birthing experience with my, my partner was, um, you know, I, I just connected to that story. I, I connected also that it was, that they, they were the, uh, they were the everyday people, you know, they weren't the, the doctors and nurses. They were the everyday people who were tackling the mystery of the virus and dealing with the lockdown, um, much like uh, many people that I know have, and myself and my family as well, how we've dealt with it. So the scene you're seeing, you're going to see is, and I, you know, in a commentary, I think, I think that's, it's, I, people have said this before, but, you know, um, uh, human emotions uh, run the gamut of, of, you know, we laugh, we, we cry, uh, we get angry, we get, you know, there's all sorts of different feelings, especially right now during the pandemic, all sorts of different ups and downs. And I think that's what this, this couple, uh, uh, you know, this is what they do in this film and, and give to us. Uh, so um, yeah, here's a scene, uh, just a little intimate moment. There was many little intimate moments that they gave to us and, uh, uh, and just so special. And, and I, I felt like, it was just things that I even I don't see in um, in a Chinese relationship. I felt like, if, in a way, that that observational camera. Um, I, I'm I'm kind of sort of astounded by how the filmmaker behind that camera was able to kind of get all of that out of the the scenes that we have in this film from them. So, why don't we take a look at it? 放這裡,然後我要打這裡,然後我們的手要這樣子。你不要。你們就不要一種扭秧歌的表情看著我。<笑><笑> 
，可以让我转圈圈。转圈圈。<笑>不，不是。<笑>啊<笑>！我都说了不要，不要再转了。我说一圈而已。好，一圈一圈一圈。烦死了，真的是。<笑>打你我的手还疼。好，我我我我。Yeah, she's she's uh, she's tough love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and that scene that scene follows um, a scene where um, where some of the 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 workers have, and medical staff at the hospital yeah. are dancing yeah. with each other and with patients, yeah. which is a very sweet moment. And then it, it cuts to this couple, and, and yeah. in a way. Given what we've seen of them up to now, we 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 did not expect to see them dancing. <laughs> <That's> um, <true. laughs> you know, because because I think what's at the heart of the the conflict there, which you voiced, you know, you articulated earlier, is is this fear of the unknown, and they have a child on the way, and we've certainly learned that that pregnant women are particularly mm -hmm. at risk, and so and yet you also admire his 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 spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and his determination to help. He's great at drawing people out in the cars. He gives rides to workers or through right. the empty streets. And um, so they they really are a great character. Yeah, one of the things that, that it makes me think of when I see that, when you said, you know, you were amazed at, at what the what the, the shooters on site were able to capture. Do you think um, there's an element in in there and, and, and in your other work um, you know, this idea of the camera actually acting as a, as a kind of therapeutic tool uh, for, for the subjects, uh, a, a way to articulate a, a means and a reason to articulate things that sometimes they may be more reluctant to say. It's very much the case, especially when I'm working with uh, uh, Chinese subjects uh, who usually are you know quite reserved and careful um, I think that the technique of so-called observational filmmaking is is one where you spend a lot of time with uh, with your subject and so there's a comfortability around that and then there's also depending on who you get uh, um, and there's a I guess it's a process of of also when you're uh, finding the characters for your films, uh, you want to find the people who are willing to open up or have the ability to potentially open up. And I think that uh, uh, once that comfort level is, is reached, um, there, the camera does have an uh, ability to be this sort of mirror into somebody's world and a device in which I find that subjects are comfortable to open up more so than they would uh, if they were alone. And, um, and many instances, and sometimes kind of problematic in some ways is when, and I think you talk about it in, I mean, I think Stevie is a filmer, you know, anyway, so like, I think there's these things that come up where you as a filmmaker have to grapple with as well, which is how far is, can you go with, with, you know, prompting or, or not prompting, but pushing your subjects to open up. I think um, in this case with Ying and Xun, I, I, I feel that, uh, uh, Chun was very open. That's the uh, the wife. Uh, she was very open to just sort of being as much as she could that that character of herself. Uh, and uh, um, my sense is that that is her. That is her real personality ramped up a little more. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, I think I think there is this misnomer about observational filmmaking where where people think that we are just sitting back with the cameras on our shoulders, uh, um, just, you know, they say the fly on the wall, right? Which is hardly the case. Uh, I think observational filmmaking, in fact, we are quite active with our cameras and as filmmakers, we are uh, 
finding the details and the and the way to um, push through a, a so-called scene or a story um and um uh i have to say when i being the so-called you know the editor on the other side here without being in the room with them uh there were instances in the editing process where it was frustrating where i i wished that there could have been a, a different way of shooting or framing a scene but but in the end in this situation we're sort of like well we can't do anything about it this is what we have and and this is how we're going to have to we'll have to find a way to carve this scene out of the material which you know editors are like your director essentially and and with an editor much can be done with shaping a character out of nothing yeah what maybe you've just answered it but yeah. what 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 is it about um, you know, you, you can make films in a lot of different ways and documentaries these days are made in, yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a genre within documentary for every kind of filmmaking imaginable now. Um, maybe that wasn't always true, Yeah. but, um, what, what is it that has drawn you in not just this film, but your, your body work, what, 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 what drives you, uh, as a filmmaker creatively and otherwise, and and the style of observational that you yeah. you've taken on, yeah, a, you know, I think it really depends on the subject matter of the film that I want to make. So I'm, I'm, you know, I I do all kind of. I feel like I do all sorts of different stories, uh, uh, just because I'm curious about that world. I mean, I I I made a television documentary about a pro wrestler. Um, I made a film about fruit hunters. You know, people hunting or preserving fruit and uh, um, exotic rare forms of fruit all over the world, you know, and, and that it just seems so outside of what I'm interested, of what I would typically people expect of me to make. But, but I think I'm driven more about the, uh, uh, the subject. And then, ha and then I think what predicates the storytelling for that subject is it can be anything. And um, if you need to do talking head interviews, then you got to do it that way. If you need to find a way to, uh, you know, in Fruit Hunters, we use animation. And I had an approach where I wanted to use, we used maquettes and and um, stop motion uh, and animation, but all handmade because I wanted it to be that organic kind of feel. Um, and then for China Heavyweight, that's a pure observational, so-called observational film where, uh, which was a great feeling for that particular movie because I had a very clear, clearly defined cooperation, like a collaboration with the subjects. We each knew like, this is how we're gonna make this film together. And, and uh, there were moments of the unknown and unanticipated, which is where is the story going? But there was also a clear feeling like uh, that, um, you know, I would tell their story and that and that somehow that story would then help them out later. And, and it's essentially what happened. Um, uh, the film about Robert Fisk, the journalist, uh, uh, that was ru really run and gun. We defined it as, uh, in fact, that's probably the most pure um, verite filmmaking I've, I've, I've done, uh, where because it was about a journalist, we couldn't slow things down. We couldn't ask Robert Fisk to set up a shot to walk through through the frame. It was just sort of, if we missed it, we missed it. So that, that was uh, quite a liberating experience. And, and I, I would say that my produce, one of my producers, Anita Lee, uh, encouraged me at that time for that particular film to not know where I was going with it. Um, oftentimes with my films, I want to know the shape. I kind of want to know where I think it's going to go. Uh, it helps me to, to kind of get my head around what I'm making. Um, but for this is not a movie, it was sort of just, just relax. I was encouraged to relax and find the story in the editing room, uh, which was kind of shocking for me because, you know, I don't know about you, Steve, but I kind of want to think it through and when I'm making it on location and know where and how, how I think I'm going to use it or where it's going to fit in the scheme of things. But um, for that film it was just sort of like, we'll figure it out. And it really worked out well. It was a good feeling. Um, I probably shot a little too much as a result, uh, but that was okay in the end. It was all right. You know, we had it so that we had the time to work on it in the editing room. Um, 
but for Wuhan, Wuhan, it was similar. It was sort of like, well, I can't be on location. Um, I have the material in front of me. Uh, let's just see what we can piece together. You know, let's see what we can do with it. And it makes me think yeah. about uh, a filmmaker, Alan King. Did you ever, do you know Alan King? Um, I, I, I've seen some of his work, yeah. Yeah, this is remarkable also from that school of observational filmmaking. But I know that um, I had an opportunity to talk to him and he, he was never on location. In fact, he was a director who worked with a cinematographer who he'd send out to film. And then they would go through material together in the editing room and then he'd send the cinematographer out to continue shooting based on the notes that Alan would, would give the cinematographer. And that to me is sort of what came into mind here. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, I didn't have the open channel with the team because the footage was already filmed, but there was this, this feeling like, oh yeah, you know, this is an interesting process to be able to sit away from and have a, dis a little more distance from your subject. I don't know. I don't know. It, it, I don't think I'll do it again, but it was, I toyed with the idea that, wow, this could be a potential model for, for future yeah. filmmaking. Yeah. And I think it's good. It's good to stretch yourself in different directions like that. Right. I mean, you, when you were describing, um, and I haven't seen your film, uh, with, but I'm making a mental note to see it on yeah. Fisk. Yeah. Um, but that sounded very similar to the process I went through with City Surreal, which was, um, you know, I'm not a pure verite filmmaker. I've never been a pure verite filmmaker. Some, some, some of my work is more verite and observational than others. Um, some of it's not observational really hardly at all. Um, but, but with City So Real, I think we really tried to go out and embrace this idea that we have no idea where our day will go. We, we know where we're starting usually, because we have to decide where we're going to start. <laughs> um, but we really, it took a while to, to really fully embrace that approach, you know, I, I, so I relate to what you were saying. It took a while to really give ourselves over to what, whatever happens, happens, and whoever we encounter along the way is potentially in our film, and, and we, will, we will figure out what this, this film is later. Um, but I tell you, having, having gotten to that place where we were able to really fully embrace that, it was exhilarating. It, and as a part of me that kind of doesn't want to do it differently now. I mean, there was, I think one of the things that was always so strong about Maisel's work, particularly, uh, you know, films yeah. like Grey Gardens, yeah. um, was is that you felt like anything could happen in front of that camera. Yeah. Um, and and, and kind of anything did. Um, and you didn't feel the hand of the filmmaker um, shaping it, but you did feel the filmmaker was a part of it mm. um, in, in some really interesting ways. And uh, it's almost like a truer verite to me than, than what is generally described as verite, which is this idea of fly on the wall, right? Mm. This, uh, um, which we know doesn't really exists. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe Frederick Wiseman does it that way. I don't know. But but most most don't um, because it's impossible. And it's yeah. not even desirable. I think that's yeah. part of it, you know? I guess, wow, that's so interesting to hear because, um, yeah, City Surreal definitely has that, the, um, that impulsiveness of an active camera, you know, catching those uh, Vox Pop kind of interviews and, and you know, diving into a... Um, into places and 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 capturing those these really off the cuff moments, um, uh, but did you do you find that you so you don't I find that you apply that to previous films of yours as well. There is that feeling, but I guess you you this was more of a an approach that you applied to the filmmaking rather than do you know what I mean? Like yeah, this was this was as far as I've ever pushed it because. You know, usually, you know how it is, you're out there um, filming and people, you're filming a story and someone will come up and go, hey, what are <laughs> yeah. you doing? You know, yeah. and, 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 and frequently they want to be in your movie, yeah. right? And most of the time in my films, it's like, well, <laughs> I appreciate your interest, and, but we, it's not really about you. <laughs> this, was, this was a film where if you wanted to be in the film, 
well, come mm. on, what do you want to, what do you want to tell us? Yeah. Because it was, we were trying to create a kind of mosaic portrait, yeah. if you will. So this was liberating in that way of like, it took a while to, to fully embrace that, to not feel like, you know, uh, like you had to have it kind of figured out more. Mm. Um, you know, I always tell people when I do classes, it's like when you're out filming, you, yes, you do need to kind of have an idea of the story you're telling in your mind because it, it, it helps you decide what to film and what not to film. Exactly. But I never want to be so rooted to it that it, that I'm not open to the left turn that can come your way that makes it all the more interesting for you and a more interesting film. And exactly. And then, and that's where I think in the editing, then that's where you make all these other discoveries, right? You, it's scenes that you thought were just kind of okay. For me, when you were doing it, suddenly in the editing, it's like, oh my God, this is an important scene. <laughs> I didn't think this was that important. You know, I, yeah. I wasn't that perceptive to see its place, but now I do. And yeah. That's, do you that's like, kind you, of you, do, of do, do you like, uh, do you like, you love, I mean, how, so uh, you've edited films, you've, you've done yeah. this. And I'm and very actively involved in most of the films that I make as an, ed as an actual editor. So when you, for City so, City so Real, for example, did you just, were you there right from the get-go, from the assembly onwards? Were you present in the editing room? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. And that's what that you do, one. yeah. Okay. Yeah, if I can, you know, and I have, I have great collaborators. Uh, David Simpson is someone that's worked oh, yeah. with me a lot and he's a, you know, an amazing editor. Um, and so I, I rarely edit all by myself anymore. Um, but, but I, I love, I just love the process. Mm -hmm. I love being alone with the material in the mm -hmm. room and, um, and, but I also love having collaborators. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love having help, yeah. smart, smart, good help, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, I learned, I learned a long time ago that I needed those collaborators. And I, uh, yeah. if I was, I, if I was set to, to see a film through myself, it would never see the light of day. And that I need people talented, who are more talented than I, to kind of push a movie to its, to, to, to see to, through its end. And, uh, and, and just even in Wuhan, Wuhan, the editors that I had, uh, Avida and Zamoa are, were brilliant in that, even tag teaming that we established. We established the tag teaming process where they could just, pass things back and forth. And it was a it was a lovely way of doing it remotely, mind you. They were each in their own respective homes editing. And uh, and then, um, and just even the assistant editors that I had and the whole team of just, there was a great feeling going into this film. And, and certainly our emotional reactions to the film shifted over, over, uh, over the, basically the pen, the waves of different you know, events during the pandemic. And I think we just, it was now was the time to release the film because I think it kind of fits that, that, that kind of time right now. And if we had done it earlier, it would have been, I think the reaction would have been different. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think, uh, um, uh, I think the team was just, uh, you know, just the way of working remotely in a way honed us in more on on the that drive to tell the human story and and the fact that we were working alone and seeing such and witnessing such emotional kind of footage uh it really uh brought us together i have not met my team in person ever diane kwan the producer i've never met in person we've oh, only wow. talked we've she's, only talked she's online. lovely <laughs> she is lovely, she is lovely. <laughs> she's, a, she's, a, she's a great producer and a lovely person truly is yeah um well i we we probably have about 10 15 minutes more to go here for those of you who are tuned in if you have some questions that you want uh yeah. now's now's your opportunity here's one um uh, young, I yeah where the, this one here is uh, curious to know your thought on this uh on Clubhouse, you you heard many non-mainland Chinese Asians actually believe in the Chinese virus, I think, virus idea, side, yeah. because of Chinese Communist Party. So how can you tell stories not, not only to non-Asians to stop Asian hate crime, but also unite our own people for stopping mm -hmm. the spread of rumors about COVID-19? 
right way. Yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of kind of misinformation online, even in mainland China, of course, you know, so many different ways of, of misconstruing the truth. And uh, um, I mean, uh, I, th I think the key to that is, is perhaps kind of what, what I, what came in and the experience of making this film that uh, uh, for me, when discovering the truth that, that I found was through the, the emotional truths that I could find through these, these characters. And, uh, um, and I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that documentary speaks to that level too. Documentary filmmaking is about, uh, you know, building empathy and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, telling story through a real, you know, real life situations, but in an emotional way, um, not, you know, it's not about statistics for me. And uh, although important <laughs> and informative, uh, th this was about going beyond that. So, um, um, you know, I think, I think for me, filmmaking is, is the process of uh, exploring, you know, storytelling in an emotional way. And, yeah. and maybe that's, if anything, I don't think I'm answering that question, but I do think um, uh, that's what I get out of this process. Yeah, no, I think you got it. I think you answered it. Um, here's a question. Have you followed up with the subjects? Have you been able to follow up with the subjects of the film to see how they're doing today? Is that yeah, in fact, when you see the film, uh, there is an epilogue with each subject and, and you'll see uh, where they are and, and what they're up to. Um, uh, actually some of them quite emotional especially with the psychologist yeah. yeah um tell me a little bit about um oh here's one from amy c did you get uh very emotional editing this film considering we're still in the pandemic uh and reliving the trauma over and yeah over? yeah definitely i mean we started we started early editing the film in in uh in in may of 2020 and and you know that was still early days where we didn't know what was going on and um and and that ex-president of yours was uh, talking about the, the China flu. I can't say his name. I just can't. And uh, the China flu and all that crap. And, uh, and then having gone through that incident with my daughter, it was just, yes, it was very emotional. And witnessing some of the scenes in the, in the film that were in the ICU was, was challenging and uh, uh, very hard. Um, and knowing that many people around the world, you know, and especially in America, you've kind of come through more or less, you know, remarkably push through things in a positive way. But, uh, but then to know in Canada, we've gone back two steps. It's been an emotional ride. The editing of the film was an emotional ride. When I look at the film today, uh, as I, I think I mentioned, you know, there were stages of watching the film over the course of the past few months. And, and each and every time the reaction was different. In fact, uh, we, we were editing in up until uh, end of this, you know, this February, and and made some decisive sweeping changes to the opening of the film. Um, the original cut that we had had uh, a voiceover narration to kind of bring us into the film because we were feeling like people needed the context. Um, there was, uh, but we, you know, ha having watched it since then and, and re-edited it, it was very clear that we didn't need that. Uh, we could just dive into the story and the context was everyone knows. So, uh, you know, I wonder what it would be like to, what it will be like to see this film in a few months from now. I think if we ever get through this pandemic that uh, maybe the reaction will be different. I have no idea. I just have one last question. Um, this yeah. is kind of, you, you know, um, this is more like a kind of question that one might ask at the beginning of a conversation, but we're going to end the conversation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what, what, what is it, what is it that motivated you to want to make films? Make films um, in general? Make films and, and, and the, yeah. the kinds of films that you've been making, right? The, um, yeah. yeah. I, I just would love to, you know, you and I have known each other for a number of years, yeah. but I don't know that I ever, got that answer out of you. I, I'll, I'll tell you, and I would also like to hear your answer too on that, if you don't mind. <laughs> Can I flip that one back to you? I mean, I think uh, um, 
it's a, I don't think there's one clear answer. I think I grew up, uh, um, essentially what at the time was a small town and, um, and I felt kind of like an outsider in this small town. I was the only, I felt like we were one of a few, you know, a, a Chinese or, or, you know, um, Asian families in this town. And, and I, I experienced a, a handful of that kind of, um, you know, racism and things like that, that, uh, that made me feel, uh, this kind of just put me outside of myself. And, uh, and so I think something that I credit my father, who I think is listening in right now. So I'm going to give him a little, my parents, a little nod, but they really gave me and my brother and I culture, uh, films, movies, uh, uh, theater, art, they, they gave us all of that uh, as young children. And, and for me, it was a real outlet. There was a way, there was a, it was sort of a way to, of expression and, and emotional expression that you couldn't nail through um, my everyday life. You know, I had to go to this other place to find those things. And, and I think, so from a very young age, I knew I wanted to make film. My father, had a Super 8 projector and he would get uh, abridged films from the library. You know, I'm thinking of like Wolfman versus Frankenstein and black and white silent films. And he would <laughs> wow. set it up in the basement of our house. And my brother and I would watch these uh, silent films worrying, you know, with the worrying Super 8 projector. And that was a magical time. And, and then I think going through my exposure to, well, it was Michael Moore's, um, uh, his, his first film. Um, I'm sorry, oh. I'm blanking out on it's the name of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, what's happening? Yeah, now I am too. Yes. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. But Michael yeah. Moore's film about uh, Flint, Michigan and... <laughs> Roger, Roger and me, and me. <laughs> Roger and me, and and to be honest, uh, Steve, it was seeing your film Hoop Dreams, and and just seeing that there was a way to tell stories that um, it was mind blowing. That documentary could be cinematic, could be, uh, you know, it could be, it could fill this void of of a, a need of expression and and also searching. You know, I think. Uh, me feeling the outsider, it's what brought me to China to, to make up the Yangtze. It's what, it, it's what, it, you know, and this feeling that I want to um, explore culture and, and Chinese-ness and, uh, and, and, and kind of find a way to, to show that to international audiences as well was part of it. Very long answer, Steve. I don't know if I'm nailing. Oh, it, but, great answer! You know. that's a, yeah, no, that's a great answer. I, what I about you? <laughs> I don't really want to answer now. My answer is not nearly as interesting. Come on, um, come on. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think with with me, you know, my my dad liked Charlton Heston movies. Um, I saw <laughs> so did my dad. <laughs> I, I, I saw the Ten Commandments and uh, you know th those kind of films, and he was a big fan. Um, he was not a movie buff though, but, uh, I, you know, I actually think in a, in a, in a different, clearly very different way, race, um, yeah. played a, a role in, in my, um, eventual ev evolution towards being a filmmaker. Um, I grew up in a, in a small, smallish city in Virginia that was very, uh, racially divided, not not confrontational, but, but divided mm -hmm. and, um, and trying to figure out how to reconcile being a white guy who lived in a redneck neighborhood, who played basketball with a lot of, uh, African-American teammates and whose dad's business was in the black part of town was, I, I think all of those were our roots that led me eventually to hoop dreams. <laughs> And and led me to uh, you know I guess the the things that the the, the themes that I have mostly explored, yeah. Um, but I think yeah I think it goes back to my childhood. Um, yeah. In, in a in a very different way, obviously I was white, in a you know in, in a privileged position compared to what you were dealing with growing up. But 
but here we are both filmmakers so yeah but I, I mean i have to say there's a disposition to the kind of of a, being a documentary filmmaker maybe and especially i um what i see in you is this uh this openness this curiosity this humility that is uh just um you want to open up you want to talk to you you know i i want to <laughs> you know there's there's something about that i think that uh that's a little, that's, you know, you, you know, and your history informs that too, right? I think it, it builds us into who we are and, and why we tell the stories we tell. I think that's your question essentially. And uh, um, no, it's a great thing to think about. I'm gonna be thinking about this tonight, um, yeah, lingering on this thought. Yeah, we should have another chat about it. <laughs> we should, maybe in person. <laughs> yeah, in person, exactly. <laughs> We don't live that far apart. That would be All great. right. Yeah. Thank well, you. Hans, I think, I think that's your cue to come back. <laughs> thank you everyone for, for sticking around too. Um, and, and thank really? you to everyone, DGC especially and Hans and, and Ryan uh, doing all this stuff and Steve for doing this and uh, Kartemquin yeah. and Gordon who has, I, has been just following us through to the end here. Thank you, Gordon yes. Quinn. <laughs> yes, Quinn. <laughs> Thanks to the two of you guys. I mean, I, I didn't want that conversation to end. I was, I was doing okay. So <laughs> for another hour. That was fantastic. Thank you. Really, seriously, for both of you, incredible filmmakers. Um, amazing to have both of you here together talking about filmmaking, talking about Wuhan, Wuhan, uh, which is a beautiful film. Uh, yeah. Um, Check, no. it <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> Thank you. We're, Thank you. Uh, at Hot Docs, uh, uh, Toronto and Doxa and Vancouver. I think they're geo blocked to Canada. Uh, yes. So those of you in Canada, definitely check out those films. Does it have a US release yet? Yeah, we're we're rolling through the US. Um, some announcements already at uh, Cam uh, Cam Fest in, in San Francisco and uh, uh, Sarasota, and there's a bunch of other festivals just coming around. So right. you can always check us out on uh, our Facebook, Wuhan Wuhan Doc. And we have a website, Wuhan Wuhan Doc.com. And uh, we'll be updating it. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, congratulations again. Uh, and again, thanks for spending all of this time with us tonight. It was wonderful. Thank you so uh, much. Yep. For those of you watching uh, tomorrow night, as part of Visionaries, we've got Elmaya Tail Feathers. Uh, and the meaning of empathy joining us and then Friday night we have Steve J Adams and Sean Horlor with their film Someone Like Me both also incredible incredible films so join us for that as well invitations will be going out uh, specific invitations will be going out uh, on the day uh, so look for those uh, tomorrow morning for El Maya and uh, Friday for someone like me uh, young Steve what can I say? Amazing conversation. Thank Great. you. So much. We'll Thanks for again. making this happen. This has been really enlightening and I really appreciate your time, Steve. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And thank you to all the people that tuned in. Great. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>